start yeah it's a start uh, it's recording now you can start now okay so the first topic microprocessors and microcontrollers a microcontroller is an integrated circuit that performs a specific operation in an embedded system a, a microprocessor usually consists of a processor memory input output peripherals on a single chip now we'll look at the microprocessor a microprocessor is a controlling unit of a microcontroller uh, what a microprocessor does it it takes input instructions from the memory it decodes it processes it and produces an output microprocessor is performs early operations and it communicates with other devices connected to it uh, so now the differences between the microprocessor and a microcontroller the first difference is in a microprocessor the peripherals are connected externally like um so a microprocessor just consists of a cpu all the other stuff rom ram input output ports are connected externally to it while in a microcontroller this whole thing like the cpu ram rom serial interface input output ports are this whole thing is a microcontroller that is the peripherals are inbuilt and the another point of difference is a microprocessor is not made for a specific task a microprocessor does complex stuff uh, like for example a personal computer we can it depends on the user a user can play games a user can do web browsing or watch videos or photos it a microprocessor is not made for just one task while in case of a micro microcontroller it already has a predefined work for example cameras or washing machines they already have a they are made for one specific task right uh, so these are the main differences between microprocessor and microcontroller some other differences are difference in cost other uh, microprocessor it does complex task and it it is meant for heavy processing that's why the cost of microprocessor is will be more than a microcontroller in case of power consumption the power consumption of microprocessor is greater than a microcontroller because all because the components are connected to it externally the, even the clock speed of a microprocessor is greater uh, um, a clock clock speed means the processing power or a processing speed so the processing speed or the clock speed of a microprocessor is 1 gigahertz to 4 gigahertz while that of a microcontroller is 1 megahertz to 200 megahertz i'm sorry so here's the next topic that is analog signal and digital signal analog signals are con con analog signals continuously vary with time like uh, that is analog signals are a continuous function of time that's why analog signals are represented by a sine wave whereas digital signals are discrete in value and time uh, if you want to get a digital signal then you have to make a unique combination of high highs and lows high is denoted by ones and lows are denoted by zeros this a uh, unique combina combination of highs and lows gives us a particular information an example of a digital signal can be the on and off switch it's either on that is high or either off there's uh, nothing in between and um, if we talk in terms of the noise if there is a slight fluctuation in the signal then a noise is created in case of analog signal but for digital fluctuation does not create any noise i hope it's clear if okay so the next topic is the development boards uh, a development board is a printed circuit board that con consists of a processing unit and a minimal logic support uh, the most commonly used development boards are arduino uno raspberry pi and nord mcu the reason that we need to learn the differences between three is that uh, the features of all the development boards are different we need to have some knowledge of at least the commonly used board so that we can find the most suitable board most suitable board for our task so we'll compare arduino uno raspberry pi and nord mcu arduino uno and nord mcu are microcontroller development boards 
while raspberry pi is a microprocessor development board the next uh, criteria for differentiation is a uh, logic level uh, a logic level refers to the low or high state of a development board that is uh, when we say that the logic level of arduino uno is 5 what we mean is when you set the pin high it will measure 5 volts similarly logic level of raspberry pi is 3 volt and logic level of nord mcu is 3.3 volt c and c++ are the languages that are used in arduino uno whereas raspberry pi supports its own linux based operating system and Uh, Nord MCU is programmable with Arduino IDE. Um, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Um, and uh, next point is internet. If we need to connect Arduino Uno to the internet, we'll need additional modules or shields. Uh, whereas for the Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi and Nord MCU had has a built-in Ethernet port and Wi-Fi support. as for the cost uh, arduino boards are cheaper uh, they cost around 500 rupees to 1000 rupees raspberry pi are way much expensive than that uh, they cost bit in between um, 4000 and 10000 and nord mcu like in generally speaking they are cheaper than some arduino boards uh, as for the drive strength arduino uno has a current drive uh, current drive strength means the amount of current that the board can handle as for the nord mcu um, it cannot operate with higher current that it cannot operate with current that is more than 12 milliampere but arduino uno can handle the current of 40 milliampere the next point is clock frequency the clock frequency of raspberry pi is the highest that is 1.5 gigahertz then there's nord mcu with clock speed of 80 megahertz and clock uh, and arduino uno with the clock speed of 16 megahertz it means the uh, the processing speed of raspberry pi is the highest among all so if we need to do a task which needs a very high speed processing or you know a complex task then raspberry pi is preferred over arduino uno or nord mcu as for the ram um the ram of raspberry pi can support up to 8 gb of external ram whereas um arduino uno or mcu uh can support like a very ram of arduino uno is 2 kb and that of nord mcu is 64 kb then the number of gpio that is general purpose input output pins raspberry pi has large number of gp IO as compared to Arduino Uno and Nord MCU. Like uh, for Raspberry Pi, there are forty pins, and out of that, twenty-six pins are general purpose input output pins. And uh, when it comes to like uh, difficulty to learn, uh, Arduino Uno is very beginner friendly, and it has many tutorials available on the internet. While Nord MCU doesn't have many tutorials available on the internet, though it is easier to handle. we will move on to the next slide so this is the arduino board i'll tell you about the pins in the arduino board so we have 14 digital pins uh, like right here 0 to 13 out of which six are pwm pins a uh, pwm stands for pulse width modulation uh, these are the pins we use when we need an analog output Like uh, here are the pins: the eleventh, tenth, ninth, sixth, fifth, and third. These pins are PWM pins. And here A zero to A five are analog pins. 
Then there's a V in pin when we need a power supply of uh, seven volts to 12 volts. For, pow uh, for power supply, we can use this USB port or even this socket. Through this, we get a power supply of five volts. Then there's a reset pin. It, uh, it resets it. It resets the code. The code starts running from the start. And then there are these pins. SPI interface. Um, SPI sta stands for Serial Peri Peripheral Interface. It is an interface that enables serial exchange of de data between the two devices. Uh, by serial exchange of data, I mean one bit at a time is exchanged. Then there is I2C that is interintegrated circuit and UART that is universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. All, all these are all these enable communication between the microcontroller and another device. These these are called serial communication protocols. So these are the pins for I two C. Then the pins of SPI. So we will move on to the next one. Uh, yeah. So uh, till here, if there is any doubt, and I would like to conclude uh, the difference between uh, development boards. Uh, can you go back, Tamanna? Yeah. Yeah, here. So, uh, if there is any doubt uh, from this section or uh, the previous sections or digital block signal, uh, microprocessor, controller, or anything uh, till now covered, uh, please uh, uh, let us know. Just unmute yourself and please speak up. Mm, okay, if there is nothing, uh, then I will just uh, give a brief conclusion about these holes. So, Arima and Node MCU are microcontroller type development ports, uh, and instead, uh, Raspberry Pi is microprocessor type. So, the time when we use Raspberry Pi is when we have a complex set of sets of uh, codes uh, that we have to run, and it needs to be very high processing power to process all these things. Uh, then only we go to Raspberry Pi, but in general, uh, in general, we use Arduino Uno or Node MCU. And uh, as you can see, like uh, the clock frequency is uh, 16 megahertz. In case of Arduino, in case of uh, Node MCU, it's 80 megahertz. It's a, it's more than Arduino, but yeah, it's it's uh, kind of comparable. But if we go to Raspberry Pi, it's way more than that. It's uh, 1.5 gigahertz. Uh, but if, if you talk about flash memory again, uh, in case of Arduino, it's just 32 KB. In case of uh, Node MCS 4 MB, it's it's high. It's very much high. But uh, if you talk about Raspberry Pi, then it can support uh, way more than that. In case of RAM, it can support up to 8 GB RAM, uh, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and then uh, Arduino Uno is kind of very simple. There are so many tutorials available. So we start with Arduino Uno. And that's what we are going to do in, in this session as well. Uh, but uh, if I talk about Node MCU, then it's kind of same with Arduino Uno. Uh, even it's uh, in, in terms of cost, it's. I'm audible. Yes. Okay, I don't know why someone muted me by mistake. Also, so I was saying about uh, the cost thing. So, yeah. So then, Arduino Uno. We have so many tutorials for Arduino Uno. That's why uh, we generally go for Arduino Uno. But in case of Node MCU, it's also kind of similar. Even you can program Arduino. Okay, is what is this happening? I don't know why someone is muting me again and again.
Yeah, okay. So, uh, Node MCU is uh, cheap, and but since there are not so many tutorials available for it, so we generally don't go for Node MCU at first. Uh, we first try Arduino Uno and uh, uh, we begin with it. If I talk about programming uh, of these things, so Arduino Uno and Node MCU programming is, is totally the same. Even we can program Node MCU in the same environment uh, that is Arduino IDE that, that comes with uh, Arduino or Arduino Uno or other Arduino uh, boards. So programming for Node MCU and Arduino Uno is totally same. But in case of Raspberry Pi, it's uh, different. It, uh, we have to code in its own Linux based operating system. And then if I talk about uh, uh, GPIO pins, uh, general purpose input output pins, uh, where we give input to our virtual controller and it takes output. So these are quite in large number in case of Raspberry Pi. In case of Arduino, no, it's, it's uh, lesser than that. But if we want to use Arduino versions of uh, microcontrollers or development boards, then we have we do have another kind of boards that is Arduino Mega also. So if you have a criteria of more number of pins, then we should uh, we might look into some Arduino Arduino's other version that is that might be Arduino Mega also. Uh, in case of Node MCU, yeah, so it's it's generally very less number of pins, even it's lesser than uh, the Arduino. Uno. So we might not prefer Node MCU in case we uh, want to go for uh, more number of sensors or anything as such. Yeah, that's it. I think. Yeah, I think next next slide. Great. So I'll just give you a brief idea about uh, some coding commands that we definitely are going to use uh, when we code anything in Arduino. So the first thing is pin mode. So first we have to define whether we are going to use any pin as input, output, or input pull up. Input pull up uh, will be explained later. Uh, but uh, first we have to define whether we are going to, going to use this pin uh, that we will be using, uh, uh, whether it is an input pin or uh, we are going to take any kind of output from that. We have to define that first. And then uh, there is this uh, digital, digital write. So how do we use it? It's nothing but uh, we are defining high value or low value to a particular pin uh, that we have already defined as output pin. So this is how we use it. And the way I have written, it's uh, syntaxically correct. Like I have written digital and then uh, W as capital. So this is the exact syntax uh, that has been written here. Uh, for digital read, uh, we just have to provide the pin number. Uh, that we want to read whether this pin is high or low and then if we come into the analog part analog uh, signals then there is uh, this analog write so how do we give an analog signal is uh, we use uh, pwm waves uh, that is pulse with modulation uh, that will be what this thing is uh, that will be covered later part but i'll just give you a brief idea about them so we give our uh, analog output through this uh, analog write. Uh, we define pin and then the value. Uh, and this value ranks from 0 to 225. And this 0 to 225 is being mapped uh, to 0 to 5 volt. So say uh, if we are uh, giving here 225, then uh, the voltage that will be coming out will be 5 volts uh, from that pin. And in case we are providing 0 here as a value, then the 0 volt will be coming out through that pin. Uh, so we can just map this uh, 0 to 225 to 0 to 5 volt. And uh, according to that, the voltage level will come. So it's generally being used for uh, any variation in brightness or uh, speeds of motor, etc. Uh, in case of analog read, uh, according to the logic level of 
development boards in case of Arduino Uno, that's five volt. So we just uh, gave the number of, uh, I mean, uh, the value of pin that can be A0, A1, A2, A3, up to A6, A5. So uh, this is how we uh, read the analog signal through this command. If there is any doubt in it, uh, you can ask. Okay, um, fine then. Yeah, Taman, I think we can go ahead. What is input pull up? Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, this thing will be what like this input pull up uh, and input pull down. Uh, this will be covered uh, later part uh, by ERI. Okay. As I mentioned. Because we have to like tell you what this pull up thing is happening and then that's a bit. Uh, we have to elaborate on this. So it will be covered later. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So now we'll do some Arduino programming in Tinkercad. Uh, I'll share the screen once again. Is it visible? Yeah, it is. So on the right side, here are all the components and here's the code. Uh, just to give you a brief idea what this Tinkercad is, it's nothing but uh, the simulation software for Arduino and related stuffs. So we can simulate our circuits and uh, get an idea what will happen if we do these things physically. Uh, all these things. Uh, so uh, now we'll grab. Go ahead. Okay, and we'll grab an Arduino. Also, here are all the pins that I told you about: the zero to thirteen digital pins, the PWM pins. These are the analog pins. A zero to A five. And there's V in. This is the USB socket. So what we'll do is we'll do the blinking LED project. So for that, we'll take an LED. We'll join the cathode to ground. You just have to click the ends of the components to get this wire. And then we'll use a register. A register helps in limit the current in limiting the current without it. There's a chance that LED will burn itself. Out. And we'll join the other terminal to pin 13. The other terminal of the register to pin 13. Now we'll uh, start with a code. Um, so this is the basic syntax. Uh, whatever is written here in the function void setup will be executed just once, while whatever written here in void loop will be executed again and again. So we'll be setting, uh, okay. Look, this is a built-in LED. This is connected to the pin, to pin 13. And we have connected the anode of our LED also to pin 13. So when it says built-in LED, it's talking about pin 13 only. Okay, so we'll um, uh, put the pin 13 for, uh, for the output. And then uh, in the in void loop, we'll use the function digital write and make the 
met pin 13 high that is the led will begin to glow then we'll use delay to wait for 1 second here 1000 means 1000 milliseconds we'll use delay then wait for 1 seconds then again we'll make pin 13 low now the led will stop glowing then we'll wait again for 1 seconds then this will repeat again and again and this is how we'll make the led blink so we'll start the simulation and the led is blinking uh so do you want to ask anything any doubts okay then we'll move to the next topic can you show the code part Yeah okay great yeah, okay, great Okay shall we move Yeah yeah mm, there is some echo here yeah, I mean uh, when I open the code part I'm not able to see the coding screen Uh oh, it is okay. showing the built in and this one but uh, What happened Shreeja uh like that coding part uh, i'm not yeah. able to see the code screen where you write the digital right and stuff uh like go here go there's yeah. a box on the left yeah yeah blocks plus text is it yeah blocks plus text aha uh -huh. right 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 or, or just text is also fine right okay yeah right, right yeah yeah that's also fine this okay Yeah, Samana, could you show that screen once again? I want to explain certain things. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, if uh, you guys see uh, in the void setter, uh, we have put the mode of pin. and in the void loop uh, we have put that code that we want to run again and again so if you see uh, this there is this digital right uh, led we have defined and then uh, we are calling it as high and we are waiting for one second to let it be in that uh, position and then uh, we are going to make it low and then uh, wait for one second and then again make it high and that's how it's going in the loop so what happens is uh, when we start our code so if there is uh, anything uh, from if there is nothing in uh, outside these two functions uh, if there is nothing above a uh, void setup then our code just jump into this function uh, that's called void setup so we define our pins uh, we initialize certain things or anything uh, that just we that we want to run just once so we put all those things in void setup and uh, if you want to if we want to include any kind of libraries or uh, if we want to define any data types any variables then we put uh, it outside uh, any function so the part where if you have seen uh, the c++ code is written uh, so in these lines or outside these two functions we define those things uh, i think you will see uh, all these things in detail in the later part uh, but yeah, i just explained a little about that Yeah, come on now. Uh, you can take it. Now we'll uh, look at the data types. 
the data types specify which kind of data you want to store in a variable i guess everyone might be very familiar with it like uh, the in data type it takes space of two bytes and it can store uh, a number between minus 32768 to uh, positive 32767 then there is unsigned int it's just like int but uh, it can't store negative values so it will store values between 0 to 65535 then there is long uh, we, we it takes up more space that's why we can store a large number of numbers larger number of numbers as compared to int or unsigned int then there is unsigned long which is same like long but we can't store negative values its range is between 0 to 4 to 9 Um, then there is float for storing decimal decimal values. Char for storing alphabets, capital A B C D, small A B C D, and there is string. Other space needed for string depends on the length of the string. Like a string is basically a set of characters. So the more the characters, the more space it will need. So here's the syntax as to how to initialize one. Uh, we write the name of the data type, then we'll write the name of the variable, like whichever variable you want to choose, and then we assign it a value. Like for example, here we are assigning a value. You got muted, I guess, Tamanna. Hello. Yeah, you're audible now. Oh, you are explaining uh, this integer a is equal to. Uh, since when was I muted? Uh, this integer a is equal to nine. Example. Okay. So we have to store a value nine inside a. Nine is an integer, so we'll use the data type int. Then the variable, and then we'll assign it a value. So, uh, sorry for that. So now this is how we initialize variables. Uh, yeah, right. okay. So now Ira will take forward. If there is any doubt uh, till now, uh, please ask. Okay, then I think uh, Ira, you can take forward. I hope my screen is visible. Oh, yeah, indeed it is. Okay. So, hi everyone, I'm Ira Rai and uh, I'm pursuing my BTEC in Aerospace Engineering from IITM. And I'll be taking forward this session by uh, introducing you these two topics. So, we'll study about proximity sensors, uh, then motors, and introduction to Arduino and Tinkercad. So let's start with proximity sensors. So what are proximity sensors? So these are the sensor basically which detect presence of nearby objects within a specified distance. Uh, so the distance can vary from sensor to sensor. It can be uh, from like uh, two inches to 10 mm or 30 mm. So, uh, so 
without any physical contact. So because of this very reason, these sensors are highly reliable and they have a long functional life. Also, uh, none of the proximity sensors include any moving part. So because of all this, uh, they have long functional life. And uh, proximity, uh, proximity sensors can be found in our daily life applications, like, for example, in our smartphones for emerging from sleep mode, uh, whenever some notification or something comes and we put our smartphone in front of our face, so we are able to see the notification and the phone emerges from the sleep mode. So that's because of proximity sensors. Also uh, in robotics, uh, you can uh, see uh, proximity sensors for detection of obstacles. For example, uh, in this image, this is a robot and we have five proximity sensors here. So it, it is useful in detection. And also like, uh, for example, in parking areas for safe parking. So while backing a car, we, uh, we would need some uh, alarm, some detection that we should not back some further, some, some threshold limit. So we would have a proxy, proximity sensor, which would send, uh, send the output uh, if the, uh, we are backing the car, uh, car uh, more than some limit. So it would send the output, electrical output to some buzzer and the buzzer would ring. So that would alarm us that uh, we should not back it further. So in our daily application, this, uh, these are some of the examples of proximity sensors. So we have uh, various types of proximity sensors, but these are our five major types. So first we have acoustic or ultrasonic proximity sensor. Then we have photoelectric, capacitive, inductive, and magnetic. So in this images, this is a capacitive a proximity sensor. This is ultrasonic and this is photoelectric. So we'll study uh, their basic principles uh, one by one in brief. So a posture proximity sensor or ultrasonic. As you can see in this image, this is an ultrasonic sensor. So they are useful for object detection over some intermediate distance, some feet. And they're also useful for measuring distance because we can cal uh, it can calculate the time, total time taken and uh, uh, the distance can be calculated by this particular formula that is speed of sound into total time taken divided by two because the pulse goes and comes back. So the, so the distance is two times. Also, the working principle is quite simple. It consists of two transducers in which one emits and the other receives the ultrasonic wave and converts it into electrical variation of some, of some frequency. So next we have photoelectric proximity sensors. So they also have almost the same working principle as acoustic sensors. So they are useful in detecting objects and change in surface conditions also through optical properties. So the working principle involves an emitter and a receiver. So an emitter emits the light and the receiver receives the light and so it gets interrupted or reflected by the sensing object. So it changes the amount of light that arrives at the receiver, the intensity of light, it gets changes. So this change is detected by the receiver and it is converted into an electrical output. So this part is same for all the proximity sensors. Some change is detected and it is converted into some electrical output. So some of the pros we have for uh, these sensors are it has long sensing distance that is greater than 10 mm. It's comparatively long and it can detect any object. So the detection is not limited for uh, some specific objects like we'll study further. The inductive proximity sensors can detect only metal objects. The magnetic uh, proximity sensors can detect only magnets, but it has no such limit. So it can detect any wood, plastic, or any sort of object. Also, it has a fast response. So it is obvious as because uh, we know the speed of light is quite huge in 3 to 10 to the power 8. So we get a quick response in these sensors. And also, it can detect colors. This is quite a unique uh, property of this sensor because uh, as the uh, emitted light will uh, strike the target, so according to the color of the target, some particular frequency will get absorbed 
and some particular frequency will get reflected, which is received by the receiver. So in this case, that change is detected by these sensors. So these are some of the advantages of these sensors. Let's go to capacitor. So capacitor proximity sensors. So, so every sensor uh, notes some change. And in this case, some change in capacitance is read by the sensor. So uh, it is able to detect objects through non-metallic walls with its wide sensitivity band. It ha uh, like all the other sensors, uh, this also has a long service life due to absence of any moving part or any physical touch also. So in uh, this case, we have mainly two types of proximity sensors uh, capacitor. So one is dielectric type and the other is conductive type. They have a uh, little different working principles. So we'll first study the dielectric type uh, pro uh, capacitor proximity sensor. So the capacitor proximity sensor, uh, this consists of a high frequency oscillator along with a sensing surface formed by two metal electrodes. For example, like here you can see this image. So we will have two metal electrodes here and electric field would be there between these capacitors. So uh, as the any uh, object would approach this, so in this case, in the case of dielectric type, our only condition is the object should have a higher dielectric constant than air. So that uh, there is sufficient change in the electric field between these capacitances. So as the target will approach, there would be some change in the electric field and this change is detected by the sensor. So as a result, as this target approaches, the oscillator circuit starts oscillating and changes the output state of the sensor. So when some particular amplitude is reached by the oscillator, the oscillator circuits are generally like of LC type. Um, and uh, as the object moves away from the sensor, the oscillator's amplitude decreases. So this switches back the sensor to its initial state. So also, if we, we would go back, so when an object comes near the sensing surface, it enters electrostatic fields of electrodes and changes the capacitance of oscillator, as I explained it right now. So the typical sensing range of this kind of capacitor is few mm to one inches. Also, in like modern capacitive sensors, uh, the range can be extended up to two inches. So, as I said, uh, if the target has a larger dielectric constant, it, it can be detected quite easily. Also, this is a schematic representation. Like, uh, electric field is there when there is no target, and when the target approaches, the electric fields increase, a change is detected. And this change uh, increases the amplitude of the oscillator, which further sends the output to the sensor. So this was our dielectric type capacitor. So uh, uh, again, what was the basic principle? It was the dielectric increases electric field of capacitance. So this is the main property that is utilized in this type of sensors. So let's go to the conductive type. So in conductive type, the property utilized is this. Capacitance varies with distance between its two plates. So in this case, we do not have any uh, metal electrodes here, but instead one of the plates of sensor is one electrode and the target acts as another electrode uh, and a second plate of capacitor. So one plate of capacitor is inside the sensor and the other plate is the uh, obstacle or the object. So, so this now the air between is the dielectric medium. So in this conductive type, as the uh, object approaches the sensor, some capacitance would be there and the distance decreases. So the capacitance increases. Again, the oscillation would increase up to some amplitude and some output would be sent, electrical output. So, and if uh, the target moves back, if the target moves back, the distance would increase. That would decrease the capacitance 
and that would again decrease the amplitude of the oscillator and it would bring back the sensor to its original state. So these are the two properties that are applied in these two types of capacitor proximity sensors. So now we have, uh, I hope it's clear till now, uh, we discussed three types of sensors, capacitors, photoelectric and acoustic. So these two had um, basically same principles. Uh, this one had a, a little different principle. So I hope it's clear. So let's move on to inductive proximity sensors. So this sensor operates under the electrical principle of inductance. Like uh, it uh, follows the Ferrari's law where a fluctuating current induces an electromotive force in a target object. So these non-contact proximity sensors detect ferrous targets, which is obvious because uh, we have an oscillating magnetic field here. Because the oscillating, because we want the magnetic field to be variable. So according to Ferrari's law, the uh, metal in a, a variable electric field will have induced currents. So these currents are called as eddy currents. So let's see here the working principle. So the oscillator creates a symmetrical oscillating magnetic field that radiates from ferrite core and coil array at the sensing surface. So when a ferrous target, so this type of sensor is limited for ferrous targets or metal targets because only they can produce eddy currents. So when this enters the magnetic field, small independent electrical currents which are eddy currents are induced on metal surface. So what happens is this, when uh, these eddy currents are produced, the some magnetic fields due to these currents also uh, is induced. And this is in uh, opposite, uh, in reverse of the incoming magnetic field. So because of this, the intensity of this magnetic field uh, decreases. And again, this change is detected by the oscillator whose amplitude again uh, increases or decreases respectively and the uh, final electrical output uh, is sent to the sensor. So basically again this change this is the change that is observed by the sensor. So due to this load will be caused on the sensor that decreases electromagnetic field amplitude as I explained. So these sensors have high switching frequency they are useful in metal detection in harsh environments and the detection range can be 60 mm. So these both are the uh, most similar representations of what I just explained. So we can move further to, so we have next magnetic proximity sensors. So these sensors are, are specifically designed to work with magnets so they have high mechanical stability and uh, shock and vibration conditions. So, so magnetic proximity sensors have various type of technologies, but uh, in this slide, I'll be just explaining two types that is read switch and the Hall effect sensor. So read switch or like read sensors make use of read switch. So they use a magnet or electromagnet to create a magnetic field that opens or closes a read switch within the sensor. So basically this is a reed switch and we have two ferrous objects here or two ferrous rods here. So as the, uh, when there is no magnet, the rods are apart. But as soon as the magnet approaches the reed switch, the magnets uh, are joined, the uh, switch uh, switches are joined. So uh, it contains two ferromagnetic, uh, ferromagnetic nickel and iron reed elements, which are these in an evacuated hermetically sealed glass tube. Hermetically sealed glass tube is just an air airtight glass tube. So to minimize contact or arcing, when an axial, uh, so when a magnet approaches the switch, uh, the magnetic forces closes the reeds. So these are called reeds, these magnet, uh, ferrous reeds. So in presence of a magnet, these reeds are closed. So it obviously detects the presence of a magnet. So next we have Hall effect or Hall effect sensor. 
So it is a type of sensor which de detects the presence and magnitude of magnetic field using the Hall effect. So I hope you all remember what the Hall effect was. It uh, when a thin a rectangular plate is was placed uh, when it was connected with a voltage and some magnet and some magnet uh, with uh, static uh, elect, uh, magnetic field is brought closer to it. Then uh, there was induced electric field. So this was the Hall effect. So Hall effect sensors respond to static non-changing magnetic fields. So this is an important difference. Like this is the key difference from inductive sensors. So in case of inductive sensors, the magnetic field was variable, which was important for the production of eddy currents. But in this case, the magnetic field need not be variable. It is static, so it can detect magnets easily. So this is what a Hall sensor looks like. This is the Hall effect. Um, so this was all about the proximity sensors. We discussed five types of proximity sensors and their uh, basic principles in brief. So I guess we can move on further with motors. So the classification of motors that we will be studying here is in regard with its application in robotics. So we won't be studying like AC motors or DC motors, but we'll uh, classify, we have classified it as servo motors and stepper motors. So this is in regard with its application in robotics and some electronic stuff also. The basic principle is same. It converts electrical energy to mechanical energy. So let's start with the servo motors. So this is what a servo motor cross-section looks like. We'll study uh, in more detail here. So a servo motor is a type of motor that can rotate with great precision. So when uh, we want a robotic arm to move by some 30 degrees or by a little bit like uh, by 10 degrees, we want its fingers to uh, move or rotate by some 10 degrees. So we can't use a uh, AC or DC motor in that case. So we need servo motors. We need great precision of motion, great precision. Of so we need servo motors. So normally this type of motor consists of control circuit that provides feedback on the current position of motor shaft. So this feedback allows servo motors to rotate with great precision. I'll be stating more about this control circuit in the next slide. So the basic uh, working principle is, so these servo motors basically consist of a simple motor. So this motor can be AC or DC motor. Then we have a gear assembly and we have a potentiometer and a shaft. So a servo motor is a closed loop servo mechanism that uses position feedback to control its motion and final position. So the input to its control is a signal, either analog or digital, uh, representing the position commanded for output. I'll be explaining more of this in the uh, next uh, slide. So as you can see, this is a robotic arm, and we have six servo motors working here for every joint, for every uh, rotation of joint. So let's see here. So this is the mechanism that I was talking about. So this is a microcontroller. So this can be any microcontroller. So Arduino is also one kind of microcontroller. So this gives the command or whatever the uh, code we have uploaded. So like we wanted uh, want the DC motor, the motor to rotate by 30 degrees. So we have uploaded that particular data here. And this data is transferred to servo controller or this control circuit. This control circuit transfers the data to the motor and the motor rotates by the given angle by 30 degrees or any input angle that we have uh, written here. So this is a closed mechanism, uh, this whole mechanism. So this data again comes back to the control circuit and then the control circuit keeps the motor in that state at the state of 30 degree rotation. It stops the motor at that state. So we have the data comes back to the 
control circuit. That's why it is called as position feedback. So this is the servo motor case, and this is its basic working principles. So let's move on with the stepper motors. So stepper, this is how stepper motors a motor looks like, and this is a cross section of it. So a stepper motor. First, I like to explain it through this diagram. So we have a stator here. These are called stators, and we have windings in these stators, right? And this is a rotor. A rotor can be any permanent magnet or any electromagnet. So these uh, these stators. Uh, so when we pass current through these stators, but in this case, what happens is we do not pass current simultaneously into all the stators. For example. Uh, this stator is connected to some switch and I close that switch and current is passed into this particular stator. So this gets energized. And because this is a magnet, some torque is created. And because of that, the magnet aligns. Suppose if this is north and this is a magnet uh, with some south here, so it aligns along this uh, stator. So by moving 90 degrees, so if this is the initial state, and uh, suppose we have a stator here and if uh, again this switch is closed and this this particular stator is energized this magnet will align itself along this stator so if you can see if i align this particular stators one by one if the switches are closed one by one so this particular rotor will align itself to the stator according to which one uh, in which one is energized so what is happening is uh, it is stepwise rotation. So it is rotating stepwise. Uh, also, th these kind of stepper motors, we play with phases. Suppose uh, these two switches are closed and current is running uh, into uh, these two of the stators. So these two will be energized. So what will be the position of the rotor? It would be between these stators. So it would be some different angle, suppose 22.5 degrees, or uh, if a uh, stator is here, then it would be along this line, which is 45 degrees. So we can align it along to our angle of our desired final position uh, of our So a phase difference of 90 degree would rotate it to 45 degrees. And so, so let's study through this now. So it is an electric motor whose main feature is that its shaft rotates by performing steps, as I explained just now. So by moving by a fixed amount of degrees, stepper motors have a stationary part, which is the stator, and the moving part, which is the rotor. In this case, you can see this is the rotor, which can be a permanent magnet or an electromagnet, and this is a stator with windings in it. So on the stator, there are teeth on which coils are wired. So for the proper positioning of the coils, teeth are there. So while the rotor is either a permanent magnet or a variable reluctance iron core, that is an electromagnet. So the basic working principle of stepper motor is as follows. I, I just said, energizing one or more of the stator phases a magnetic field is generated by the current flowing in the coil and the rotor aligns itself along that field. So by supplying different phases in sequence, the rotor can be rotated by any specified amount to reach the final position. This is all just that I described. So in case of stepper motors, uh, we can find its application in like digital cameras or even in robotic arms. In even many machines also uh, in industrial. Uh, it is quite useful motor in uh, regard with industrial purposes. So we move on to introduction to Arduino with Tinkercad. So as explained earlier, Tinkercad is a simulation software. And before moving further, I, I would like to uh, introduce some terms, some important terms. So this uh, is already known. Arduino is a microcontroller development board. Uh, this is 
already been explained, so I'll just move on. So, beauty cycle. So, mm, uh, beauty yeah, okay. cycle. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you, I think uh, we can have a break of two minutes so that uh, we can have some water. And if there is any doubt uh, till now, uh, you guys can ask. Uh, yeah, if uh, there is no doubt as such, um, I think uh, we can uh, start. So uh, I was explaining duty cycles. So duty cycle in a signal, it is the fraction of one period in which a signal or system is active. So as we can see in this rectangular wave, uh, this uh, this portion represents like in digital, this is a digital signal. So this is one, this is zero. 
So this is the active state of the signal. And this is the whole time period of the signal. So the fraction of the active state upon the time period is the duty cycle. So it is commonly expressed as percentage. So now the baud rate. So this would be useful in when I'll be uh, uh, discussing the Tinkercad software. So the baud rate is the default rate in Arduino. Uh, this is 9600 in case of Arduino Uno. So this means the serial port is capable of transferring a maximum of 9600 bits per second. So this is like uh, the rate at which the data is transferred and this is 9600 in case of Arduino. And uh, the serial port, uh, it is the communication between Arduino and our computer. So in case of Arduino, we have one serial port, which is UART. So let's uh, go to what is PWM. So uh, PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation, and it is a technique for getting analog results with digital means. So the duration of on time is called pulse width. So to get varying analog values, uh, we change or modulate that pulse width. So to get an idea of PWM, uh, uh, we, uh, I can uh, like an example we can have is like a servo motor. So a servo motor rotates between zero and 180 degree. A servo motor cannot rotate 360 degrees. So as the value is limited to zero and 180 degrees, so uh, when uh, we attach it to some uh, pin, so it will take two values, one and zero. So it is either zero or 180 degrees, but what if we want the angles between them? Uh, so we want some analog results with digital means. So that is the job that PWM does. So uh, when we are connecting servo motors to Arduino, we connect it to PWM pins. So as told in earlier by Tamanna, we have uh, six PWM pins. So these are three, five, six, nine, ten, and eleven. So we will connect the servo with uh, one of these pins because we would want the angle uh, to be either 30, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, or any any other amount, not just limited to zero or 180 degrees. So this is the use of PWM pins. So generally you can find an Arduino board by uh, approximate sign. So like if you see here, so these are 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11. You can see this approximation sign in front of these pins. So these are PWM pins, which will give us uh, analog results uh, with digital means. So next we have pull up and pull down resistors. So uh, when our pins are not connected either to the ground or to any voltage, so what is the state of that pin? It is neither high, neither low. So uh, what's the state of that pin in that case? So uh, that state is the floating state of the pin. So as we see, uh, pull up and pull down resistors are used to correctly bias the inputs of digital gates to stop them from floating about randomly when there is no input condition. So when we have no input condition, it is neither in a ground connected to ground or any voltage. And we don't want that floating state of that undefined state of the pin. We make use of pull up and pull down resistors. So uh, that floating state of pin is undefined because uh, uh, there can be any kind of thermal noise, electrical noise or electromagnetic disturbances also. So because of all this reason, the pin state, uh, when it is not connected, is undefined. So we want to avoid that state, and so we make use of pull-up and pull-down resistors. So pull-up resistors. So a pull up, uh, with a pull-up resistor, the input pin will read a high state when the button is not pressed. So whatever is our input pin, it will read a high state uh, when we have not pressed the switch. So a small amount of current is flowing between VCC and the input pin. So for a more uh, proper explanation, you can see here. So this is our pin and we have a pull up resistor here. So initially the switch is open and it is in a high state 
as it is connected to VCC. So then the switch, uh, when the switch is closed, the pin uh, gets into a low state. And we here, when the button is pressed, it connects input directly to ground. So because of this, input pin reads a low state. So this was our pull-up resistor. are much more in use than pull-down resistor. So in a pull-down resistor is quite opposite of pull-up. So in this case, the initial state is of low logic level. Uh, so the wire uh, is at a defined, defined low logic level, even when there are no active connections. So pull-down resistor holds logic signal near to zero volts, where no active device is connected. So it pulls the input voltage down to the ground to prevent an undefined state of the input. So this is our pull-down resistor. As you can see, initially the switch is open and it is connected to the ground. So initially this is at low state. And when uh, the switch is turned on, it goes into the high state. So this was about the pull-up and pull-down resistors. So I think uh, now we can go to Arduino and Tinkercad simulations. So I hope Everybody has uh, logged into Tinkercad. So I'll be switching. Yeah, so um, before we move ahead, there was some doubt regarding uh, input pull up. So that we define in the pin mode. So if you, I think you have already seen this uh, PWM in the input pull-up thing. So how this happens. So what we do, uh, we oh, define a particular pin as input. And also we make that as high in default. So it, that's what uh, we are doing when we are defining a pin as input pull. Yeah, so if there is any doubt, you guys can ask. Uh, Otherwise, you can just go to the Tinkercad and try out some uh, interesting projects. Uh, Ida, in case you're talking, uh, you are muted. Uh, okay, okay. So, thanks. so this is our Tinkercad, uh, as seen earlier. So here we have uh, many uh, electrical equipment uh, which we can use. So first, uh, in this project, I like you to know about serial monitor and how we can give inputs to serial monitor. So uh, serial monitor is something that uh, when our code is running, it tells us like what is going on with the code. So like, so we can take an Arduino here. So this is our Arduino. And now I'll scroll. So first I'm declaring, uh, first I'll write a little and then I'll explain.
So there, uh, this is a very short code that I've written. Uh, this is just for the explanation of uh, uh, serial monitor. So, okay. so first what I've done is I have declared a variable which is input byte. You can give any name. I have given input byte. So I've declared this as an integer data type. And then, uh, so this variable is a global variable. Uh, Global variable is a variable which is not uh, like I've not declared it within any function. I've not declared it within for its setup or word loop. I have declared it globally. So the use is that I can use this variable uh, inside any function or even outside its uh, outside any function. So it doesn't destroy that variable. But that is if we uh, declare any variable inside some particular function. So it won't uh, function outside that particular function. So the variable uh, can't be in any use. Uh, it makes no sense or to use that particular variable outside the function because it is declared within that function only. So that is a local variable. So I've defined this variable globally and then in void setup, I've written serial dot begin 9600. As I've said, 9600 is the default baud rate of Arduino. Uh, this is the rate uh, in bits per second at which the data is transferred. So serial dot begin begins the communication between Arduino and our computer. So after this, uh, uh, then in word loop, I've written serial dot uh, just to make them clear, uh, so in case we have a physical Arduino, so what will happen? We'll connect that Arduino through a data cable. So how yes. are we going to communicate and uh, transfer our uh, commands into Arduino? We'll use uh, this thing called serial port and connect our Arduino uh, through our, uh, through a USB port. Uh, that's what, but in case we are simulating, so everything is uh, on this computer screen uh, only. Yeah, just to make them clear how it works in uh, real when we have physical art. So as uh, like you said, only uh, uh, we have a USB port for a physical Arduino which is connected through this, and then uh, I'll move forward with the code. So uh, in word loop, I've written serial dot label. So this particular function basically is to check whether there is data received or already stored in Arduino. So if serial dot available, so if the data is there, uh, following commands are followed. So input byte, the variable that I've declared, I've written it equals equal to serial dot read. So serial dot read is a function which returns first byte of incoming serial data available. So I'll be giving some input in the serial monitor and it will read the data. So then we have serial dot print ln input byte. So these functions, these both print, ln, and write uh, will show some output in the serial monitor. So we can write here print also instead of ln, but then uh, as you see, all the uh, output would be in the same line. But if we want some, uh, if we want uh, the uh, to be from the next line, next line characters, so we write ln also it is a much neater and clearer way to visualize the data. So I've written serial dot print ln input byte. So serial dot write uh, input byte. Uh, this is serial dot write is also a function. So it writes binary data to serial board. Whereas in this case, uh, print ln it uh, writes data in human readable ASCII form. So it will print the data in ASCII form, for example. So for writing comments, we use uh, these double slashes. Right. So we'll observe this. So this is our serial monitor. So I click on it. So I'm starting the simulation. Okay, there seems to be some error. So just a moment. 
Okay, there has to be small b here. you didn't include the if uh, like yeah i didn't close the bracket yeah okay yeah so fine so right so if i write zero here if i send zero as an output so this is this is what we get so we got a zero what uh, the binary number that we entered and this 48 is the ASCII value of the zero. So what is the ASCII value of the zero? Uh, there's an ASCII table that uh, I'll have to log out to show you, but uh, I'll show you once the ASCII table. Just a This is an ASCII table. So as you can see, the corresponding ASCII value for zero is 48. This is zero, and this is the corresponding ASCII value for uh, 48. So uh, similarly, if we would have entered one, we would have got 49. So also we can work with characters and strings also that we'll see now. Right, so well, if I stop the simulation and clear and then start it again, so if I enter one here, we'll get 49. This is the corresponding S key value for one. Right. So suppose now uh, I want some uh, S key value of some character. So what I'll do, I'll change the data type here. I'll change it to character data type. So when I do that, and then I'll start the simulation. So suppose now I write here A. So we are getting A only, but it should come from S key value, okay? So it should be. Simulation. We have defined character and okay, okay, right. So like here, I've like incremented the uh, input value by one. So when we add double plus, so it increments the value by one. So if I'll type A here, then in serial dot write the value printed should be B. So let's see. Okay. Um, there should be semicolon. Yeah. See here, so like I have given the input A. So the corresponding, uh, suppose the S key values, uh, I'm just for uh, supposing purpose, suppose the S key value is something like 79. So uh, the input byte is incremented by one. So it would be 80 and then serial dot write prints the uh, corresponding uh, alphabet, which is B. 
so the s key value of uh, uh, this b it would be 80 and a would be 79 as i had incremented this particular part so we can uh, like uh, play with this serial monitor a lot like uh, we can give it any string value any character value or any integer value also for more complex circuits we can uh, give inputs to the serial monitor and uh, Let's stop this animation. So we can give inputs to the serial monitor. Suppose we have a RGB LED and we want a, a to, and we have given input red. So when we are giving input red, we want the red LED to uh, blink or to glow. And if then we are giving input green, so we want that particular color of LED to glow. So we'll check that. Uh, we'll check that out. We'll check that project. So, I'll change. So, okay, so we already have a project here. So what we have done here is, I just explained. So we uh, took an Arduino uh, uh, from here, and this is a breadboard. So when we want, uh, want to connect uh, many, um, uh, many wires from, uh, from the electrical equipment, we make use of a uh, breadboard. So for various connections, for multiple connections. So we have taken a breadboard here. It's just the purpose is just to serve, serve uh, various connections. So like, uh, like in this case, if we want to connect this wire to ground, so we can connect this wire to any of these points. So it also makes the circuit uh, much easier to assess and um, it uh, uh, makes it quite clear. And so any of these points can be used for connecting into ground. And so uh, this is an RGB LED, it's available here. If you just search for it. So this is an RGB LED. We already have it, so I'll just delete it. So for this RGB LED, we have fixed it to, a bre uh, to our breadboard. And we have taken a resistor, uh, which is just to prevent shorting. So uh, we have connected. Uh, this is red, and this is blue, and this is green. So we have connected it to the pins in Arduino, to the digital pins in Arduino. So we have connected red to the uh, digital pin 12, and we have connected blue to the 11th digital pin and green to the 13th. So these were the necessary connections that we had to make. So after making these connections, we have to write the code. And we have to write code such that, that uh, whatever input we give, uh, that particular uh, color is glows into the LED. So, for example, this. So this is our code. So uh, we need to first declare the variables. So we are declaring uh, our first variable red, which is connected to the twelfth digital pin, green to thirteenth, and blue to eleventh. All of these are integers. So our data type is int. And then we have declared a string also. String uh, is just a sequence of characters. So string, uh, we have declared color as our string. Okay, so this, this is just to initialize the string. Initializing purpose is just that it should not have any, some previous value. To just start from the zeroth level, uh, our reference level, we initialize any integer or any variable. So, so in void setup, 
we have we have declared pin mode so our pin mode uh, and we have declared the value uh, it is going to take the output so it will be taking output instead of input so our pin modes are red green and blue because we want the output uh, led will be glowing so that's our output so uh, these are our pin modes pin mode is a function i hope it's uh, unknown already it configures the specified pin to behave as an output or an input. The function of pin mode is just this. Then again, to begin the serial communication, the communication between the Arduino and the computer, we uh, uh, initialize it with this command, serial.begin 9600, which is the baud rate. And then in word loop comes our main code, and it is in loop because we want it to be repeated. Uh, we don't want to uh, the code to just run once. We want the code to keep on repeating. So in word loop, we have if serial dot as label. As I said, dot as label is basically to data received or already stored. So if serial dot as label, color equals to serial dot read uh, string. So yes. So whenever we have our input as a string, as a series of uh, characters, for example, if I'm not typing any zero or one, any number, but I want some uh, series of character like red, green, blue, hello, or any character, any string. So then our command of serial dot read changes to serial dot read string because we are reading a string, right? So color equals uh, serial dot read string. So uh, now we uh, uh, the print. So whatever uh, color will be typing here, that particular color will be printed onto the serial monitor. So that we know that this is the code. This is uh, the color that is being followed. So we have written serial dot print. You can write here ln also, but it won't make much difference uh, here. So serial dot print color. So we are delaying it by. So delay is a function. So delay is again a function which uh, delays the, which tells us the time period for which uh, the particular, uh, after which a part, after particular command it has to stop. So this by default is milliseconds. So delay 10 means a uh, 10 millisecond stop would be there after these commands. So after moving further, if so if uh, there are if else conditions, so whenever we want uh, some conditions, so we make use of if else statements. So this is the part of C++ programming. So um, if means like if this uh, particular condition. Is your screen uh, being frozen or uh, I'm just seeing the serial monitor. Is it same for everyone or uh, is it me only? You can't see the code. I, I think you should uh, keep down the serial monitor. Okay. The code is visible. Yeah, now uh, we can see the code. In the, yeah. Right. So I was, I explained the delay part. I hope uh, that part is clear. Delay is just uh, the time period for which it will stop. And then we have condition statements because we have a condition here. Like if I type red into the serial monitor, if the input given is red, then the red LED uh, should glow. So we have a condition. So whenever this is the case, we make use of if else statements. So if color equals to red, if this is the string that I have typed into the serial monitor, then uh, digital write. Uh, then uh, these digital will give me the output. So I have given, you can write here high also, or low also, but uh, it's just, it has to be binary as it is digital pin. So digital right will give the output. So the red will be in a high state, that is in active state, which is state of one. So I have written one here. So digital right, again, green and blue should be zero. At the time I want the red part should glow. 
So I'm putting green and blue zero. So I hope it's clear digital right and not. Uh, it was explained previously also. It just assigns high or low to a digital pin. The only job is to assign high or low to a digital pin. And these variables are already declared globally above. So red corresponds to the 12th pin. So this 12th pin will be in a high state when red is entered. So after these commands, there would be a delay of 2000 milliseconds. And then uh, I, again, we have written digital write red to the zero. So we are saying that uh, when we write red, uh, it will glow for uh, two seconds and then it will be in a low state. Like it won't glow any further after that. If we remove the statement digital write red comma zero, then the LED will keep on glowing red until we change the string to green or blue or just stop the simulation. So in this way, it will glow red. So first, I, I think we can see how is it working. So suppose I type red here. My input is red and my input is a string. So, okay, we haven't started the transition. So I'm starting, I've typed red here and then see here, like, so the red part glowed for two seconds and then because of this command, digital right, uh, where it is uh, so red comma zero so because of this command it uh, stops glowing so because i wrote red uh, the red part of the led glowed so let's stop the simulation and the further part of the code is quite similar now this was the if else condition so this was the condition for if like if i type red then the uh, red uh, should glow and else statement is if I do not type one thing. Yes. I don't think we need uh, else after every if it yes, will work but, even if uh, we are providing it in the end. Yeah. Yes, because we have given separate conditions, so this part is quite necessary unnecessary. So we can remove that part. So here also this part is not required. So I'll just explain this uh, condition for blue and green, which is quite similar. Again, if uh, our color, if the string that I've typed in serial monitor, if it is blue, then uh, which one should glow? The pin, this one, 11th pin. So for that, I've written digital write blue comma one. That means it should be in a high state. It should be in an active state. This blue pin, that is the 11th pin. So again, if uh, the rest of the code is same only, I've delayed it again for two seconds. So you can delay it by any number of uh, any seconds. You can write here 1,000 or 3,000, any amount of time. So again, if I write color equals to green, if the string is green, then, uh, then the green part would uh, glow. So it would be digital write. Uh, the, so this would read one here uh, so which is the active state so we can just see here in serial monitor now what happens if i write blue or green so i'm sta uh, starting so i write green here so it will glow for two seconds and then it uh, switches off or goes to its low state so again if i Type blue. So, again, it was blue. And then if I type red here, it would be red. So this is how you can control the color, whichever color you like, by giving the input yourself uh, with the help of serial monitor. So this is. The use of serial monitor. Uh, this was one of the examples. I hope this is clear. The coding part is clear. We have just uh, used some of the function. We have declared variables. 
and uh, we have declared in teacher and string variables. Then we have assigned the pin mode uh, that is read uh, as output, which is obviously this is output only. And then we have serial dot begin to start the serial communication. And then uh, we have used the if else conditions in the word loop function. So, I hope this part is clear. Digital write, it just assigns high or low to a digital pin. So not many functions were used here. So I hope this is clear. This part should be uh, kept in mind. Like uh, whenever we are using strings, so we must write serial dot read string. But in case of integer or even character, uh, the, it works with serial dot read only. We don't need this string part. So this was one of the projects and let's move on to uh, the last project for today. So in this now, last- uh, uh, Ira, I don't think we'll be able to uh, cover that up. The time is about to up. Uh, okay. So we'll see that tomorrow. Tomorrow or uh, Saturday? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So uh, the next session, I mean. by tomorrow, I mean the next session. Yeah. Right, so great everyone. Uh, if there is any doubt, uh, you guys can ask here. Um, I'll share the task as well as some references and uh, to so that you can uh, be aware about some different things and try out uh, some interesting stuffs by yourselves. All right, so if there is no doubt, uh, then uh, you guys can just leave. Or if, if there is any doubt, you can uh, just be here and ask. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's stop recording. <laughs>